so yeah, thank you um, to everyone who will be watching uh, this mm -hmm. video. And thank you um, very much to uh, Professor uh, Euron Thurborn, uh, who is joining us um, today on this call that is um, hosted by the uh, DSA International Committee Europe Subcommittee, um, and um, also is being um, co-sponsored uh, and promoted um, by, by Jacobin Magazine, um, for which we're very thankful. Uh, my name is Chris Manzano. I'm a member of Democratic Socialists of America, New York, uh, and I'm also uh, a contributing editor to, uh, to Jacobin. Uh, and I'm here with uh, uh, my co-host uh, for, for today's uh, talk, uh, Maya Adareth. Maya, um, feel free to introduce yourself. Um, hi, yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for watching. Um, so my name is Maya. I'm also a member of um, DSA. Uh, New York, even though I'm based in London right now. Um, and I guess uh, the idea behind, so we're kind of launching a series uh, which looks at the trajectory uh, of European social democracy, um, both on a country by country basis um, and uh, in a kind of general um, way. Um, and I guess the idea uh, for, for this series started off um, with uh, a book that, that I uh, edited uh, for a publication I work on called Phenomenal World. Um, and the book was inspired by this uh, moment uh, when the Sanders campaign uh, took off, um, when we had uh, kind of this moment of political opportunity. Um, and the idea was to, um, you know, to see how we can capitalize on this moment, but also to kind of reflect backwards and think about uh, what real constraints um, leftists face uh, when they have power. Um, and so what, what are the kind of barriers, uh, what, which of the barriers that uh, leftist governments faced uh, in the 70s were um, real? Um, and which were just kind of a product of the moment or the discourse. Um, and so, so yeah, so this series is, is kind of inspired by those same questions. Um, and we have a lot of speakers lined up uh, to speak. Uh, we have uh, people on Spain, Germany, France, Italy, the Nordics, um, but uh, we're starting off uh, today um, with uh, Joran Thurborn, um, who's a professor emeritus of sociology at Cambridge, um, and he's among the most highly cited contemporary Marxist sociologists. Um, he's published on questions of uh, class politics um, through the lens of um, family gender relations, social theory, urban development, inequality. Um, so he's really uh, just a fantastic scholar and we're really, really honored to have him speak. Um, and his talk is titled uh, Between Markets and Solidarity, Meanderings of Post-Industrial Social Democracy. Um, so Yoron, thank you so much again for coming um, and take it away. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's evening here in Sweden, but I guess it's it's still afternoon in, in New York. Uh, I should say that the, the title has become slightly longer in the uh, work of preparing this talk. It's actually now called Between Markets and Solidarity and in Front of the Climate Crisis, Menderings of Post-Industrial Social Democracy. And you will soon see why I've found it important to, to make this addition. Now, social democracy is a political current which has to be understood in its historical development through the past 150 years. It was a product of industrial capitalism growing up with the development and through the capital labor dialectic of the latter and falling into crisis with the deindustrialization of advanced capitalism. This was no terminal crisis, however, but a non-linear trend of declining membership and electorate. What followed was a motley set of attempts at navigating a changed capitalist world and its geopolitics, moving between market adaptations 
and reaffirmations of equality and solidarity and with variable results. Now it is standing in front of the climate crisis, a challenge and social reform opportunity much larger and more faithful than the depression of the 1930s. Social democracy originated in Europe and has always had its center there, but its, its example has had a growing global attraction. The Socialist International, which is the Social Democratic International, uh, which a, a group of its old European core has actually left in the last 10 years in a particular uh, division, which I won't go into here, but which of course weak in the international. But nevertheless, it's important to, to, to notice, that's why I'm mentioning it, that it has full membership parties in 81 countries, 36 of which have joined in this century. And in Europe, as I'm speaking, social democrats are governing all the four Nordic countries, the Iberian Peninsula, Albania, North Macedonia, and are about to take office in Germany. So social democracy is still a significant political force. The main achievement of social democracy is the welfare state with some not insignificant help in continental Europe from fear of communism and from Christian democracy. The most developed welfare states, the Nordic, owe their beginning to the anti-depression class deals between social democracy and autonomous farmers' parties. But a post-World War II development were rather pure social democratic accomplishments. Developed welfare states were much more than Keynesian economic policies and social benefits. The welfare states were answered to the existential social questions and demands of the working class and industrial capitalism. Demands for rights, dignity and respect. And as the international sang it, we have been naught, we shall be all. Demands answered by social citizenship, public services, social entitlements, decent housing, job safety, employment and workplace rights, access to higher education, gender equality, daycare. Insofar as it was social democratic, the welfare state was an embodiment of class and civic solidarity but under the restrained, although powerful, reign of capital. In the course of capitalist welfare state development, two crucial questions arose. First, the liberal question. Now, in the 1950s, when all people are affluent, are public social policies really needed anymore? The winning social democratic answer was yes. Now we can really afford to provide everybody with good life chances and with security in times of need. After the great expansion of welfare states in the 1960s, there arose the question among social democrats. Is the welfare state the final goal of the social democratic labor movement? In several social democracies, in particular, the Nordic, the Austrian, and the French. The answer was no. Social democracy started as a movement for socialism. Over the years, socialism had become more and more distant and its meaning vague and blurred, but it had not disappeared. As democratic socialism is one in the minds of part of the leading and the activist generation of social democratic parties around 1970, and was very much discussed in the letters between Willy Brandt, Bruno Kreisky, and Ulo Palme in the 1970s. 
For all its edged nebulosity, the notion of democratic socialism still carried some idea of another kind of society being possible and desirable. In the early 1970s, it had been reactualized by the massive labor struggles and left movements in France, Italy, and in many other countries in 1968-1969, and by the socially radicalized anti-imperialist youth of the period. It had a material base in the development of industrial capitalism according to the Marxian analysis. That is, of the tendency of the cap capital labor dialectic to strengthen labor's force of resistance. The late 60s, early 70s were the peak of industrial working class size, unionization, industrial militancy, labor party votes. And those years also contained the lowest point of economic inequality under capitalism. In the 1970s, early 1980s, there was a corresponding radicalization of social democracy, manifested in the French Front de Classe, the common program of the socialists and the communists, and the rupture with capitalism goal of the early Mitterrand presidency. In Sweden, the Social Democratic Trade Union Confederation adopted a program for the gradual socialization of the Swedish economy through mandated wage earners funds. And this was presented together with achieving in legislation the most far-reaching legal trade union rights, making all enterprise changes objects of employer union negotiations. In Denmark and Norway, social democratic projects of economic and workplace democracy encroaching on capital power were launched. And in Germany, humanization of work and extension of co-determination were put on the agenda. These projects all evaporated in the course of the 1980s. They were launched when labor and the developed capitalist was already standing at the tipping point of drastic weakening by beginning the industrialization, outsourcing of production and globalized capital flows, threatening national capacities of economic and social policy. The progressive social democrats were also completely unprepared for the brutal multi-pronged counter-offensive unleashed by capital its ideologues and politicians. Nevertheless, the attempts at advancing in the directive direction of democratic socialism are noteworthy examples of modern social democratic hopes and ambitions with which later developments may be compared and contrasted. The second half of the 1970s shook the world economy and national Keynesianists could no longer deliver. The British Labour Party Prime Minister James Callaghan threw in his towel early, telling the party conference in 1976 that, quote, the option of spending your way out of a recession no longer exists. And quote again, high unemployment, quite simply and unequivocally, is caused by paying ourselves more than the value of what we produce. They, meaning the manufacturers, must be able to make a profit. In other words, in the middle of the 1970s, European working class strength and militancy was squeezing the capitalist rate of profit. And if an exit door could not be seen or even imagined, neither among the striking workers nor in the social democratic labor leadership. The only solution was to force down or at least hold back capital's labor costs. 
that is, workers' wages. The decade from the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s was a wave breaker, reverting the forward march of labor and the 20th century process of economic equalization, instead exalting capitalism and unfolding a cult of individual success. Social democracy has changed track in a way similar to that of the Japanese elite after their World War II defeat, by embracing defeat, as the US historian John Dower called it, aligning itself with the victor, following his leadership, adopting his norms and institutions. In psychology, a similar phenomenon is, is known as the Stockholm Syndrome, whereby uh, a hostage-taking bank robbery uh, in 1973 ended with the hostages bonding with their captors. The victor over social democracy was neoliberalism. And social democracy and Democrats now disavowed their own achievements and helped undermining their institutions, keeping only a few disembodied so-called values. The crucial document of neoliberal third way social democracy is a joint declaration in 1998 at the height of its influence. Uh, it's signed by Tony Blair and Gerhard Schröder and is titled Europe, the third way, the neue Mitte. After an introduction, it starts with a catalogue of concessions to right-wing accusations. Quote, the promotion of social justice was sometimes confused with the imposition of equality of outcome. The result was a neglect of the importance of rewarding effort and responsibility. Unquote. The chief ideologue of the third way, my predecessor at Cambridge, Anthony Giddens, accused first way social democrats of, quote, an obsession with inequality, unquote. The SPD New Labour paper continues, quote, the means of achieving social justice become identified with ever higher levels of public spending. The belief that the state should address damaging market values, failures all too often led to a disproportionate expansion of the government's reach and to bureaucracy." Unquote. Giddens went as far as to call the welfare state, quote, undemocratic because depending upon a top-down distribution of benefits. Blair and Schroeder continue. The ability of national governments to fine tune the economy in order to secure growth and jobs has been exaggerated. Then the declaration went on to present what they called modern social democracy, which according to them is above all standing up for quote, economic dynamism and the unleashing of creativity and innovation. Modern social democrats, they say, quote, recognize in the right circumstances, tax reform and tax cuts can play a critical part in meeting their wider social objectives. For instance, corporate tax cuts can raise profitability and strengthen the incentive to invest. Unquote. And then quote again, modern social democracy want to transform the safety net of entitlements into a springboard of individual responsibility. And another quote, the final one, the labor market needs a low wage sector in order to make low skilled jobs available, unquote. While welfare state building was a matter of class and civic solidarity, the neoliberal adaptation was focused on market competitiveness of individuals on the labor market, as well as on states competing in the global economy, and also 
on building a big European market. The neoliberal embrace had an obvious appeal to the arrivist and aspiring middle classes, offering some cosmetics on stony-faced neoliberalism pure. Blair and Schroeder did mention social justice after all, even though the only lesson from it was that social democratic concern with social justice had been flawed. The turn also resonated with tendencies the dissolution of the labor movement, the drastic weakening of the trade unions by the capital offensive, the disintegration of deindustrialized working class communities, the mutation of labor party members into professional electoral machines. It also coincided with a generational and class shift in social democratic leadership. The generation coming, F com, coming after Olof Palme, the so called grandchildren of Willy Brandt and Bruno Kreisky, as they were told. The turn worked electorally for a short while in the European 90s and early 2000s, East as well as West. To most electorates, after the first bite, anything else than undiluted neoliberalism appeared better. Third way market adaptation was undone by two factors. First, the accelerating inequality and crisis proneness of the new financially driven capitalism brought the withdrawal of support and soon an electoral protest of the losers and the abandoned in the new competitive games. Secondly, there came a blowback on the unannounced return of imperial militarism within the interventions in the civil wars of succession in ex-Yugoslavia and a whole set of invasions of the so-called Middle East from Afghanistan to Libya. Blowback, both in the sense of anger against the meaningless devastation uh, caused and also by the mass migration fleeing from it, which came to change the social and the political landscape of Europe, spawning a rise of new xenophobic parties. And for his mendacious campaign for the invasion of Iraq, Tony Blair turned from the poster boy of the third way to the most despised politician in Britain and to unelectable social democratic candidate for the new leadership post of the European Union. In Eastern Europe, the swift, swift switch of the converted ex-communists to neoliberal social democracy proved disastrous after spells of unexpected office in the second half of the 1990s and early 2000s. In East Central Europe, or the Baltics, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. The new social democracies were kicked out into seemingly permanent marginalization, thriving only now in the poorest, the most corrupt countries of the Balkans. Instead, neoliberal social democracy in Eastern Europe laid the basis for the reign of authoritarian and culturally reactionary culturally reactionary, but socially attentive right-wing parties. The embrace of neoliberalism led on to a series of historical defeat of social democracy in its Western European heartland. Four, four parties have been more or less wiped out or dwarfed. The Italian, the Greek, the French, and the Dutch. But social democracy's survivability is significantly affected by the electoral system. Under the Westminster system, a Labour Party having made it to the head table as one of the two main parties had a good chance of sooner or later winning the electoral lottery. 
as the New Zealand Party uh, did recently. And with proportional representation, as in continental Europe, the once big Labour Party may keep a pivotal position in the party system to get the upper hand in coalition or alliance negotiations. The Nordic social democracies, for instance, are now all well below the 30% of the vote, the Finnish even below 20%, but they remain central in very fragmented party systems. After their failed attempts at neoliberal market adaptation, after the financial crash of 2008, and after the World Economic Forum of Davos in 2012 recognized mounting inequality as a worrying foreboding of socio-political instability, European social democracy have tended to return to egalitarianism and defense of the welfare state. This is explicit in the Kevin, current or oh, recent government declarations in Germany and in the Nordic countries, except Sweden, where Sweden, where social democracy has become dependent on the country's most aggressively neoliberal party, its historical coalition partner, the center party, the Farmers League. And restoring a corroded welfare state can be politically very difficult. For example, the extraordinary opening of good parts of the Swedish education and caring sectors to international venture capital registered in tax havens, more similar to the elite political economy of countries like Liberia than to UN democracies has become entrenched in a new post-industrial bourgeois power and lobbying system. The climate crisis finally actualizes the necessity and the opportunity of a different kind of society. The now almost universal recognition of the necessity of profound, profound transformations of the existing socioeconomic systems has offered an opportunity for a socialist or a social democratic vision of a new, different society. It seems that this opportunity is being missed, like the chances of stopping a severe deterioration of planetary life from climate warming. The Nordic and the German social democracies don't see the crisis that way. From the most recent programs, from coalition government declarations in the party congress recently of the Swedish Social Democratic Party party, and another common view comes out. The cri climate crisis is mainly a technical problem in course of being solved by renewable energy and new industrial technology. And its politics is seen as an exciting prolongation of existing politics. National goals of carbon neutrality by 2045 and substantial reduction of emissions by 2030. A green industrial revolution is started. In all the five countries, this is seen as offering great opportunities for national industry and business. And a kind of international political leadership role, even for small countries like Denmark and Finland. Nowhere is it framed in a program of wide-ranging social reform, uh, unlike the Green No Deal of the progressives of the US Democrats. Instead, the Northern European Social Democrats are euphoric about national competitiveness, job creation, and international leadership in the limelight. Danish government declaration says, for instance, quote, the world market for green transition is only getting bigger. It is a unique opportunity for Danish business which shall be exploited." Unquote. The Finnish, 
the world of the, tw the 20s needs trailblazers. An ecologically sustainable Finland will show the way. And the Norwegians, no emissions cuts shall be the core of the strategy for growth, export and job creation, unquote. However, quote again, Norwegian petroleum industry shall be developed, not dismantled. Permits to search for oil and gas shall still be given, unquote. In her inauguration speech this November, the new leader of the Swedish Social Democrats told the party Congress, quote, there is a climate race between the countries of the world. And right now, Sweden is running in the leading group. We see now the beginning of a green industrial revolution in Sweden. The incoming German coalition of Social Democrats, Greens and Liberals has a very strong climate focus to be run by a new Ministry of Climate and Economy under a Green Minister. But climate protection is put in a framework of modernization of the state and the country. His main goal is aiming at no more than 1.5 degree of climate warming. To what extent the actual program is actually on track for that is not yet clear. The transport sector is largely shielded from short-term transformation. The exit from coal should only, quote, ideally occur in 2030. And until renewing renewable energy for carbon neutrality is available, new gas, gas power stations will be built. The social market economy will be decarbonized into a social ecological market economy. And, quote, we can see the road to a COVID, uh, carbon, dioxide, carbon dioxide neutral world as a great chance for the industrial position of Germany, unquote. The transformation of the economy is not a social question, but one of technology and investment. The social policy part of the coalition declaration includes some corrections of the worst illegalitarian effects of the social democratic Schroeder government in the beginning of this century. Ideas of substantial minimum wage rise and a less harsh system of welfare benefits. But the upgrading of labor rights promised in the SPD's electoral program was abandoned and there will be no higher taxes and no redistribution. Understandably, the main organizations of German capital have received the coalition government quite positively. The Northern European social democratic dream of a new industrial dawn is a missed opportunity of social reform but it should also be seen as an eye-opener to the complexity of climate politics and to the variety of visions and courses of action available or conceivable. The alternatives are by no means limited to capitalist apocalypse or anti-capitalist rescue. In that timely book, Creating an Ecological Suds, Creating an Ecological Society, Fred Magdoff and Chris Williams claim that, quote, capitalism has no off switch, no method for changing its basic methods of operation, unquote. But profits can be made with a range of technologies, from the plantation hoe to renewable energy and carbon dioxide capture, and by switching from one to the other. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, a formidable mobilization of Western finance capital, is claiming to have, quote, over 130 trillion of dollars of private capital committed to transforming the economy for net zero, 
unquote. The most likely scenario of currently prevailing climate politics seems to be a muddling through vested interests of all kinds, geopolitical and electoral, as well as capital, to an increasingly inhospitable and ecologically unjust, but still survivable planetary environment. In the, this decades-long crisis process, space and possibilities are viable, are av available for a variety of political projects and social transformations. For the time being, the most elaborate strategies, however, appear, appear to be those of green industrial capitalism in the global north and of a global capitalism run by Western financial capital. So far, social democracy has abdicated from any project of radical reform, hoping only to survive as managers of lucky enclaves of green capitalism. There is an alternative crisis scenario, less probable, but not inconceivable, that there will be a radical disruption of politics as usual, following from new climate emergencies out of the long roster of probabilities listed by climate scientists and driven by the Fridays for Future and other radical movements. What processes of game change might possibly come out of such disruptions has not received much attention yet. However, even if they do not succeed, today's youth of the climate movement are likely to be the torchbearers of human hope for the rest of the century in a world of mounting anger and despair under the advancing ravages of planetary warming and of persistent inequalities. How much social democracy will remain is uncertain. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Thurborn. That was uh, really, really fascinating and really uh, a rigorous uh, overview of, of this for, for DSA members and Jacobin viewers. Um, so thank you. Um, I have a lot of questions and I know that Chris has a lot of questions, um, but if I can just start, um, we have about 15 minutes. Um, I guess the thing I'm really interested in, uh, which I mentioned in the intro, um, you brought up uh, James Callahan. Um, there's also the experience of Mitterrand. Um, and also in, in the interviews I did, I got a lot of responses that were just, um, you know, we had no choice. Inflation was through the roof. Uh, we, we had to kind of follow in the Volcker kind of strategy because we didn't know what to do. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit as somebody who was there at the time, um, about what what were the viable alternatives um, to a kind of a neoliberal policy from a socialist or social democratic perspective at the time? Um, and I think it's it's relevant now also because we do see inflation rising, um, and we see again this kind of growing fears about inflation. So I think, yeah, I think it would be great to get your thoughts on on how do we deal with with this inflation issue. Well, uh, as I indicated in, in my talk, I mean, there were available alternatives um, and presented, uh, but they were, they were presented a couple of years too late uh, before the, the, the full force of the avalanche of the, of the crisis of the uh, mid-1970s. Had, had settled, and the um, the progressive forces in in France, in the Nordic countries, in Italy, were um, in in a sense. I mean, to sum up, I mean, that's my they, they were just unlucky. I mean, there were a few uh, years too late, uh, and they were completely unprepared for the. Uh, vicious uh, response they got.
got from capital, which they should have at least to some extent been been prepared for. Because I mean that that there was already already by by the uh, uh, rather chaotic strike waves in 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 Britain. Now when there was a real profit squeeze, um, and but there was no alternative presented there. But the, the the point the point is, I mean that the there were alternatives, but they were presented just when the working class strength was bending down, uh, and uh, then it became, I mean, a, a kind of once the avalanche got rolling, I mean there was. There was nothing to to stop it, but it 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 didn't go on forever. I mean, there, uh, in spite of the uh, the the social crisis of uh, deindustrialization, outsourcing, and uh, the uh, rise of xenophobia and all that and so on. I mean, there has been a. Uh, a return of of egalitarian uh, demands, and and that's that's something which uh, will happen uh, in um, in the U.S. and, and other countries uh, as well. And and right now, in uh, there has been a a few years in which. Uh, uh, European social democracy, at least, has become, has rediscovered, I mean, its egalitarian roots. Uh, I didn't have time to to quote the uh, the social and economic aspects of the of the uh, uh, governmental declaration, particularly the Norwegian social democrats, we and also the Danish, which really show that that now that uh, the uh, smart capitalists of the World Economic Forum have realized, I mean, that, oh, and a whole bunch of uh, liberal economists in the United States have, have, have realized, I mean, that uh, galloping inequality is is dangerous. Uh, Social Democrats have uh, got their resume some courage to fight for it again. And um, I think this will probably happen in the US again. But it, it seems, uh, and I can understand, I mean, your, your receptions, it seems that they the peak moment in in the U.S. perhaps has has peaked for the for the time being, but it will return as it has in Europe and as it will even in in Sweden. We have a hopeless parliamentary situation right now, but it will not last forever. My question, uh, Joran, uh, yeah, is. I think in line with uh, a lot of the comments that you made, um, you know, I think it's certainly true that we have seen in Europe and the U.S. and elsewhere over the last few years and in the last decade or so, the return of a lot of these egalitarian demands and, and, and politics. Um, you know, and I think the growth of an organization like DSA in the U.S. and the success of a figure like Bernie Sanders here only really speaks to that um, phenomenon. Um, it seems that the difference between, say, uh, you know, the current moment and uh, the situation, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago uh, is that today those those social forces that were at the core of social democracy and the socialist movement generally, um, you know, particularly the organized industrial working class, um, you know, is smaller, uh, weaker and, and more fragmented uh, than it used to be. Um, so in this kind of context where we, we see 
you know, a greater demand for more egalitarian politics and policies. Um, but uh, at the same time, those social forces, which in the past would have been, you know, driving those demands forward into politics, have been dramatically weakened. What then, in your view, um, you know, are the political and strategic uh, implications for for left wing parties and, and movements today? Um, well, yes, I mean it, it. It's true that the the old uh, industrial working class constituency of of uh, uh, the labor movement has been been weakened, but uh, I think new constituencies are are arriving. I mean, with the uh, the new uh, uh, services or working class uh, in 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 the service sector, uh, and the service sector is is becoming increasingly industrialized in in workplace relations and and um, employer. Uh, uh, brutality and it's it, it's um, um, it's remarkable I mean how all the uh, the new tech giants for all their enormous monopoly profits are are all anti-union but that, that means I mean that the the classical issue of of, of working class struggles I mean of Right to unionize, for instance. I mean, are are still on the agenda. Um, so that's that's one part of the answer. The other, the other is uh, the 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 importance of the missed opportunity of the of the climate crisis, because the climate crisis has um, led to a, a broad awareness among, among uh, wide sectors of, of the public, not only among the, the, the smart financial capitalists, but sort of ordinary uh, middle class citizens, that uh, they can, there is something wrong with the, with the current society. And that, that's why it's so, so tragic that European social democracy, so far at least, has not linked up with that uh, crisis situation very much. Not that they are, they are not sort of uh, in climate denial or anything, they are supportive of, of um, uh, new technologies and new renewable energy and so on and so forth, but that they're the whole chance of building a a broad movement of social transformation, uh, connecting social and technological and energy changes of the economy uh, is being missed. There, I think, I mean, the uh, you in the DSA, I mean, we're more, more foresighted and more ambitious than most European social democrats. If I, if I may follow up on that, why do you think that the opportunity um, that you say exists um, is being missed? You know, why, why do you think it is that uh, these somewhat resurgent, um, although I think we shouldn't probably overstate that, um, social democratic parties and labor parties uh, are, are missing out on this opportunity to build, um, as you say, that broader uh, movement uh, to both, uh, you know, fight climate change and reshape our, our political economies. Well, as I, as I said in my talk, I've gone through uh, the uh, coalition agreements, uh, governmental declarations and, and party congresses of the Northern European social democracies. And, and, uh, and what I see is this, uh, uh, is, is 
is no connection between uh, any ambition of egalitarian and solidaristic social change and a an almost completely technologically focused conception of of climate change i'm not saying i mean that this is irremediable i mean it is not necessarily the last word but it's striking uh, the kind of i mean i gave you some quotes of the uh, of the way the the climate crisis is interpreted by leading social democrats of the nordic countries and of germany and so on and it's a there's absolutely no awareness of of any opportunity for a progressive social change not necessarily anti-capitalist to socialist that's i can understand that's beyond their horizon of imagination but it's it's nothing similar i mean to the issues that Olof Palme and Bruno Kaiski discussed in the in the mid 1970s. So far, so on. I mean, I I'm making no predictions of what I'm going to say tomorrow, but there is no. I haven't seen much opposition within the the social democratic parties for this lack of ambition or lack of vision or perspective. There is, um, and in the, and the leadership is, uh, in this part is, is, is still very much uh, dominated by the managerial image of, of Helmut Schmidt. You remember, I mean, uh, Helmut Schmidt's famous saying in the, in the 1970s, I mean that, I mean people who have a vision should go and see a psychiatrist, uh, and um, so. But uh, but there is. I've been going back to your question. Uh, radicals on the left have, have discussed and talked about and acted in demonstrations and various actions about the, the climate crisis for quite a long time and it has been a, a almost an axiom that the climate connect, uh, crisis is connected to capitalism and, and um, climate action should be crisis action should be connected uh, with uh, radical reform or radical change or revolution or even uh, social change but the the striking thing that this perspective is is absent in current northern european social democracy that's what i wanted to to convey which which i think is sad because i mean i i, I think it is an, an important opportunity uh, among other things precisely because of the the weakening of the classical working class core of the labor movement. I wonder, maybe we can just have one uh, final closing question. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, kind of building on that, um, you know, if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, over the years, there have been different ideas uh, of what socialism means, um, that socialist parties have kind of advanced different definitions in different moments. Um, and I'm wondering today, what, what do you see the term, uh, what kind of meaning does it have on a popular level? What kind of meaning should it have uh, beyond kind of, um, you know, how do we distinguish a kind of socialist platform from uh, just uh, returning to a kind of social democratic consensus um, that we had. Well, 
Well, uh, I've come to think that um, well, I mean, uh, well, two things. Um, there is a there, there is a left tradition of of socialism, and, and uh, which I think we we share and we we know. I mean, uh, what is uh, we can distinguish uh, a socialist society from a capitalist one, uh, and uh, and. We know it when we see it, or if we should see it. But um, uh, the problem with that left-wing view is that it's, it's difficult, I mean, to make concrete and, and realistic in, in a short-term perspective for a, for a very broad movement. So that's why, I mean, your question comes up, I think. Uh, but I think there is a, an answer to this. Uh, that uh, we should keep the attachment to socialism or to, and to democratic socialism as indicating our belief that a different society is desirable and possible. We don't know if it's realistic uh, in the foreseeable future. We don't know exactly what it will look like. But something better than this current society is definitely conceivable and worth thinking about and worth fighting for. Uh, to me, at least, I mean, that's, that's enough. I mean, I don't need to, uh, to know exactly what a socialist Sweden or a socialist United States would look like tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. It's enough for me to, to know that it's a quite rational conviction that a different society is conceivable, is possible. And when and where it will happen, that's an open question. Uh, I think that's a good note to close on. So thank you again, uh, Professor Thurborn. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I think our, our our members, viewers, readers here here in the US uh, and around the world will really, uh, I think, learn from uh, and appreciate uh, uh, your thoughts here today. So thank you again. Um, thank you again to DSA's International Committee uh, for providing us um, with the opportunity to, to host this event. Uh, and thank you to uh, Jackman Magazine for helping uh, to to promote uh, uh, this this talk as well. Uh, Maya, did you have anything else that you'd wanted to add before? We no, I just want to uh, thank you. I mean, for inviting me, and thank you who are listening, and I wish you good luck. The thank fight you goes so on. Much. Yes. <laughs> Thank yes, you thank so you. much. Thank you so much, Yoran. Um, take care and uh, and yeah, hope to, to be in touch at some point. Yeah. Thank I you. I hope to see you one day sometime, somewhere. Yes. I'm around. <laughs> we're we're all around. Yes. <laughs> we'll be around. Yes. <laughs> take care. Bye.